we all know that peak oil theory actually has two major points. We tend to speak, however, about one of the two major points. Uh, the, the two points are that once peak oil is reached, uh, global oil production will reach its maximum sustainable output and then begin an irreversible decline, as shown in the depletion curve of the, uh, of the Hubble's, Hubbard's peak uh, diagram, which you're also familiar with. But there's a second aspect of peak oil theory, which I think doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. And that is that typically the first half of the oil that will be produced in any oil province or globally is the easy to get oil. And that will put off till later the hard to get oil. So the easy, to, what is the easy to get oil? It's the oil that's uh, close to the surface, that's in very large reservoirs, that's on land, uh, that's close to home, and that's safe, you know, it's, it, it's safe to, to get at that oil. Um, hardly surprising that the first great oil province in the world was Pennsylvania. What's more safe, close at hand, it was very close to the surface, easy to find, easy to transport. You know, and then came Oklahoma and Texas and places like that. Uh, and we put off to the uh, end, to, to later times, the hard to get at oil. Well, the hard to get at oil is deep underground, dispersed in small pockets, uh, uh, far offshore, uh, hard to get at technically, uh, very expensive to produce uh, in, in remote areas environmentally and, and in hurricane prone areas, for example, and, and unsafe. Uh, and that's the essence, the, the second essence of peak oil theory. We have used up all of the easy to get at oil. It is gone. That's, that's, that's part of the theory that doesn't get the attention it deserves. The person I think who has best expressed this aspect of peak oil theory is, is Dave O'Reilly and the advertisement that uh, Randy Udall put on the screen earlier, and he read the part that you're familiar with, that, that the end of easy oil is over. I don't know if this bad light I could read it to you, but he said uh, that mature fields are now declining and new energy discoveries are mainly occurring in places where resources are difficult to extract physically, economically, and even politically. And what I try to show in my simple diagram is what is meant by this. This diagram shows where the rest of the world's oil is located. This is what's left of the world's oil. 62% of it is in the Persian Gulf in five countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait. 10% of it is in Africa in just four or five countries, Angola, Nigeria, Libya, Algeria, and Sudan. Another 10% in the former Soviet Union and basically in three countries, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan. 9% in Latin America, but almost all of that in one country, Venezuela, with about 7% of the world's remaining oil. The rest of the world has only 9% of oil, that's, the, that's mostly the easy oil, but uh, 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 what remains of the easy oil, but a lot of that, of course, is in hard to get at places like the Gulf of Mexico. So this is what remains, this is, this is the part of the peak energy, peak oil uh, theory that we really need to focus on from a geopolitical point of view. I want to point out that uh, of these, areas, about three quarters of them are predominantly Muslim countries. That includes all of the Persian Gulf countries. In Africa, it includes Libya, Algeria, Sudan, and a good part of Nigeria is Muslim. In the former Soviet Union, it includes Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan are predominantly Muslim. So if you add all those up, about three quarters of the world's uh, remaining oil is in Muslim countries. 
And if you include Venezuela and Angola in the list, most of the remaining oil is in countries that are unstable, corrupt, divided along ethnic and political lines, hostile to the United States for one reason or another, ruled by dictators or by fragile authoritarian regimes. Some of this is due to historical factors, divisions between Sunnis and Shiites and between other religious groups predates the discovery of oil, but we know from research that the development of oil in a poor, ethnically divided country inevitably exacerbates conflict. So the fact that the rest of the world is going to increasingly depend on these countries for their oil supplies in the years ahead means these countries will become increasingly violent, unstable, and dangerous. There's no question about that. This, the, the pursuit of oil itself is a source of violence. You have to understand that because it divides factions against each other. Take Iraq. What is the driving force of the violence in Iraq today? It's not just Sunnis against Shiites against Kurds. It's the fact that the Kurds and the Shiites want control over the oil revenues exclusively for themselves, leaving, freezing out the Sunnis. That's what the constitutional changes that they propose are all about. The Kurds already have effective control over the oil production in the northern zone. The Shiites are now ramming through the parliament effective control over oil production in the south. This will exclude the Sunnis from any oil revenues whatsoever. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that the Sunnis are the driving force behind the uh, insurrection, the insurgency in Iraq. There is no prospect of peace in Iraq so long as this process proceeds. This is the engine that's driving the violence in Iraq today that's putting American soldiers at risk. The same is true in Nigeria and in many of the other countries. I don't have time to go into each of them. The fact is that the pursuit of oil is the source of violence in so many of these countries, and it will get worse. The fact that so many of them are Muslim countries matters to us because historically it has been the pursuit of oil in the Muslim lands that has driven the anti-Americanism and the anti-Western sentiment that's at the root of the jihadism that is behind the violence and the terrorism that is so dangerous to us today. It's the, the originally the British in Iran, uh, and then more recently America and, and the French in Iraq and and in in other oil producing areas, America in Saudi Arabia. This is what lies behind the rise of the extremist Muslim movements that are now on the warpath against the United States not only in the Middle East, but in other parts of the world as well. The more we pursue their oil, the more resistance there will be to the United States. So that aspect of peak oil deserves much more attention than, it, than it's received. Now, what has been the response of American elites, foreign policy elites, to this reality? I'm gonna read very briefly from a study called The Geopolitics of Energy in the 21st century, a uh, report published by the Center for Strategic and International Studies in 2000. The co-chairs were Sam Nunn, a Democrat, and James Schlesinger, a Republican, former Secretary of Energy. Uh, and it has on its uh, co-chairs Senator Lieberman and Senator Murkowski. I emphasize this because this is a Democratic Republican response. And their conclusion, very briefly, is the United States, as the world's only superpower, must accept its special responsibilities for preserving access to worldwide energy supply. 
This responsibility has implications for military spending needing, needed to develop the appropriate capabilities for power projection and sea lane protection. It will require an intensification of diplomatic efforts to foster peace and stability and so on, and also to expand the military's ability to go into these areas and to protect the flow of oil. This is the basis of American foreign policy and military policy today, I maintain to you. This is the bipartisan policy. There is no dissent from this, either among Democrats or Republicans that I'm aware of, that the United States bears a special responsibility as the world's single superpower and leading consumer of oil to use its military power to protect the global flow of oil in the face of the circumstances I described. Now, if this policy were acceptable to the rest of the world and to the American public and the rest of the world was willing to pay for it, uh, maybe we wouldn't have to talk about this. However, this policy is not acceptable to the rest of the world it's not acceptable to the American public, and the rest of the world is not willing to pay for it. We're going to have to pay for it, and we're going to have to face the hostility of the rest of the world. We just heard a presentation about China's need for oil, and the Chinese have clearly rejected point blank the notion that the United States should have a monopoly on the use of force uh, and, and should be the dominant power in all of the world's oil producing areas. And the Chinese are contesting our ability to project power into Africa, into Central Asia, into the Middle East, and are copying some of our behavior by projecting military power themselves uh, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, by providing arms to some of the countries like Angola and Nigeria and Kazakhstan from, and Iran from which they're acquiring weapons, they're competing with us. Let me quote again from Dave O'Reilly, part of his comment that doesn't, that should get more attention. When growing, I have to get the light here, when growing demand meets tighter supplies, the result is more competition for the same resources. And that's what we face as, as the curve comes down and there are fewer supplies and we face this instability and there's more competition for it and countries have militarized their policy for the pursuit of oil, there's going to be greater friction between the consumers to get at this oil, all in increasingly dangerous areas. This is a recipe for increasing violence over petroleum. So in my mind, I'm far more concerned about the prospects for violence over oil than I am about the prospects for scarcities and higher prices. I know those are worries and they're important worries, but from a moral perspective, and from the perspective of the young people who might be uh, f coerced into s being sent abroad to protect the flow of oil and putting their lives at risk, in my mind, that's much more serious. So uh, I, I, it seems to me that in our work in ASPO, yes, we have to worry about all of the other things that we're hearing about, but equal attention has to be given to the foreign policy implications of peak oil to the fact that if we proceed in the course that uh, we, we, we seem to be headed on of, 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 of insisting on continuing to supply our needs for petroleum, requiring that they come from these places because there's nowhere else to go for them, that, that the, and we insist on pursuing the strategy of militarizing our access to overseas oil, which is the foreign policy of the United States. Iraq is just the beginning of one long succession of overseas oil wars. And this is the message we have to bring to the young people of America, because the U.S. military is becoming converted into nothing else but a global oil protection service on behalf of the big oil corporations. That is what putting on the uniform 
of the armed services is becoming reduced to go overseas, protect the pipeline, protect the refinery, protect the sea lanes. That's what it's coming to. So we have to make just as important as everything else, a new foreign policy and a new military policy that says that we're not going to use military force to protect our way of over-reliance on petroleum. That's just as important in, 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 in breaking our dependence on petroleum for environmental reasons and, and for the uh, in, in moving to more efficient energy, it's to reduce the, the risk of human loss of life in warfare. We must not make our dependence on oil a, a, a cause for risking human life in warfare. We cannot allow that to happen. That must be just as important as everything else we do in ASPO. So I thank you for allowing me to make this point. <laughs>